and um, and we'll go to we'll go to my whiteboard program. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is functions. So calculus is all about functions. You know, you study basically what we're learning about in calculus one is how to take the derivative of a function. So a function is kind of the star of the show. <clears throat> so what is a function? A function is just a, a way to associate things in one set with things in another set. Um, but in calculus one, the functions are always just functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. So, you know, real numbers are just all decimal numbers. In other, in other classes like 204, you might study other kinds of functions, but we just study functions from the real numbers to the real numbers. And usually we study continuous functions that are just unbroken lines, smooth unbroken lines. Um, <clears throat> the only time we'll look at other kinds of functions is just to show uh, what can go wrong <laughs> if the function is not uh, smooth and continuous. So often you can represent this relationship as a, as a formula. You know, you guys have seen these things all of your life, like, um, you know, y equals x squared. So we just graph that. Um, so that's both a, uh, both a, a function and it, it graphically represents something because you can, you can plot. Um, so you guys have been studying math your, your whole life. So I don't think these, these concepts are going to be too surprising, but you know, anytime you have a, a function, especially a function from just the real numbers to the real numbers, you can represent it graphically by um, by putting the output on one axis and putting the input on another axis. And um, for each input, there's exactly one output. That's that's what makes it a function. So for any input here, there's exactly one output. And that is that's all that's all the criteria that a function has to satisfy. <coughs> You can imagine, you know, there are curves that are not functions, like an ellipse or an oval or something. You can graph that too, but it's not a function because um, if you put in, if this is the input axis and this is supposed to be the output axis, if this is the input, it looks like there are two outputs, which is not allowed in the case of a function. So this is a perfectly good uh, curve and it might be the graph of an equation like you know 3x squared plus um, y minus 2 squared equals 6 or something like that. So an equation can have a graph um, that's not a function that happens all the time. So in the case either of a function or of an equation the graph is just the set of points that make the statement true right. So here on the parabola if I put in 1 <clears throat> for x, then 1 comes out. So 1, 1 satisfies the equation. So that means that that is a point that's plotted on the graph, and then the graph is just all the points, all the xy pairs that make the equation true. Same thing over here for this more general situation where you're just talking about any equation. Right. Um, so the, um, the domain of a function is the set of valid inputs. So we, we used this notation before. So, um, so all the functions that we're going to be talking about, and in some sense, their domain is always going to be the real numbers. But sometimes certain inputs won't make sense, like for example, uh, 1 over x. So if the function is 1 over x, <coughs> then um, there are certain inputs that, that don't work, like what? Zero? Exactly. So if you, put in, if you put in 0, then you get 1 over 0. And 1 over 0 is, is um, undefined. So that means that it's not, it's not equal to any, any particular real number. And in cases like that, you know, we uh, one over zero is not in there. It's not in the uh, it's not in the real numbers. So because it's the output wouldn't be valid, the input isn't valid either. And but everything else is okay. So we would say that the uh, the domain of this function would be everything except zero. 
So in interval notation, you would write that as the interval from minus infinity up to zero. The soft bracket here means zero is not included. And then you would union this with, um, again, zero is not included. That's why we're using the soft bracket here. And then going all the way to infinity. So this would be the domain of this function. So that is um, all the, uh, the possible inputs. <coughs> And the, um, the range of a function is the set of all outputs that, uh, that can occur, set of all possible out outputs. Um, so for example, we might look at the, um, the sine function. So we'll, we'll talk about this in, in more detail later, but um, so I know that you might be thinking of trigonometry as being associated with triangles, but we're, for us trigonometry will have more to do with, uh, with circles. Um, so if you take a, a certain angle here, like uh, theta, um, this is the unit circle by the way. So that means that um, the radius is, is one and we think of it as being centered at the, uh, the origin. So that's, you know, the, in other words, zero, zero in the xy plane is the center of the circle. <clears throat> so you might have some uh, angle here. And by the way, we're gonna be working in, uh, in radians. Um, so I don't wanna to review too many things at once, but I think we should probably talk about radians here. So if this, is a, if this is a unit circle, that means the radius is one, then what is the circumference? Circumference is like the perimeter, right? So if the I were to think, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. Is it two pi? It's two pi, exactly, exactly. So the way, the way radians work is, um, all the way around the blue line here, if you were to straighten that out, it would be two pi units long. So for any angle, it takes a, any angle takes a certain amount of that stuff. <clears throat> so if you were to just drive your car along the perimeter of the circle, or like let's say uh, pi over four miles, then you would, you would end up there. And so this is, this is what radian angles are. It's just sort of like if you're driving your car around the perimeter of the circle, and you went pi four distance, that's where you would stop. So this angle theta in this picture might be pi over four, which is the same thing as 45 degrees, but we won't be using degrees too much. <clears throat> so the way we're gonna understand sine and cosine here is um, <clears throat> they're just functions that take an angle in radians and then translate it into a point on the unit circle. So that point is just by definition of sine and cosine, it's cosine of theta is its x-coordinate, and sine of theta is its y-coordinate. That's just because that's what sine and cosine mean for us. Um, cosine takes the, it's the translation function that takes the angle and gives you the x-coordinate, and sine is the, um, is the function that takes the angle and gives you the y-coordinate. Um, so all the y-coordinates are gonna be between, right? So this is a unit circle, so that's one on top and minus one on the bottom. So if you take any angle, no matter what it is, and you take the sine of it, sine is gonna give you this value on the y-axis, sort of just projects onto the y-axis. So this is the sine value for that, for that angle. Um, so what, is, what then is the, uh, would be the range of the sine function? Would it be negative one to positive one? Yeah, that's right. Negative one to positive one. So those are the possible outputs. And <clears throat> can it actually realize one? So is there some input that actually makes one come out? There is, because that would, that would, at the top of the unit circle, that should be zero, one. So that's the point zero one. Um, so whatever angle that is, turns out to be pi over two. There's some angle that makes one come out. 
So that means that one is actually included in the range. And because it can actually occur, I use the hard bracket here instead of the soft bracket. That means the endpoint is in the set. And I do the same thing over here, hard bracket, because negative one should actually be in the set because negative one is achievable, it can happen with this angle, which you can think of either as um, three times pi over two. So in other words, three pi over two, or you could think of it as negative pi over two. Either one of those angles puts you in the same place. All right. So let's just keep going here. Um, so it turns out that, uh, that lines are very important for calculus. Um, if you had to describe what, what this class is about in a nutshell, you take a, a curve, which is not a line, and then by using a certain line, you understand how the function behaves in a small neighborhood by, using a, a, by comparing it to a similar line. That's basically what we're doing in this whole class. You take some curvy curve, which is not a line, <clears throat> and then we're gonna learn how to find something called the tangent line, which, is, which really is a straight line that just touches the, uh, the curve, it, locally it just touches the curve at exactly one point. And then if you were to zoom in very, 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 very close here uh, to this point, if you, got, if you got closer and closer and closer, eventually the line and the curve would just have the same properties up to whatever error that you cared about. So that's kind of like how calculus works in a nutshell, is these, um, these linear approximations that are, that are true in sort of infinitely small neighborhoods around points, around lines. Um, <clears throat> so let's review, let's review lines a little bit. So the general equation for a line is ax plus by equals um, c. So this is not a function necessarily. And that's, it can't be a function just for kind of a silly reason, which is that there are some lines that are not functions. And those are, what kind of lines are those that are not functions? If they fail the vertical line test? Yeah, exactly. So the only lines that fail the vertical line test are actually vertical lines. So vertical lines are not functions because if you look at if you look at one input here, um, the one input actually goes into infinitely many outputs. So vertical lines are are not functions, but every other kind of line is. But just to handle that one silly case, <clears throat> you have to write the general form of a line as an equation, not as a function. So if you do have a vertical line like this, let's say that this goes through three here then that would just be the line x equals three. And if you think about it, this is uh, the condition that I'm giving here, that the x coordinate is three. This is true exactly for the points on this line and no other points. So every point on this line has three as its x coordinate. And every point that does have three as, as its x coordinate is on the line. So it's just a nice way to represent a, a vertical line. Um, if something similar happens with horizontal lines. So if you write down like y equals seven or something, then that will just be exactly the points that have seven as their y coordinate. So every point on this line, if this goes through seven on the y axis, then every point on this line, I wish it were straighter, um, has a seven as its y coordinate. And so this is a horizontal line and this is a, a, a vertical line. Um, so it's, we do have to sometimes consider vertical lines, but if you're not concerned about vertical lines, then you can write lines in what we call standard form, which can represent any line except for a vertical line. So this is the form um, y equals mx plus b. And this m here is the slope of the line. And um, this b here is the intercept. So let's, uh, let's look at an actual example, like maybe y equals um, 3x minus 4. And let's, uh, <clears throat> let's draw a picture. OK. So here, I look at the, uh, the intercept term. It's called the intercept term because that term tells you where the line intercepts the y-axis. Um, so this is telling you, this negative 4 tells you that this line goes through negative 4 um, 
on the on the y-axis and um, so the line goes through there and this three is the uh, is the slope so probably you've heard of slope before um, calculus has a lot to do with uh, with slope so we're going to be talking about that a lot um, so what this what this three means is if any place on this line you go over horizontally by a certain amount and then you go up again just far enough to touch the line um, then the the ratio of the sides of this triangle so these are all similar triangles in other words right these are um, these are all going to be no matter how you do this you you're always going to get a similar triangle so no matter how you do it the ratio of these sides is always going to be the same we'll call this side delta x because the change in x we'll call this side delta y this is uh, the change in y and then the slope of this line three is going to be equal to um, delta y over delta x and it doesn't matter where you do it or how big the triangle is because um, you know all the triangles have um, three angles in common so this angle um, right those are the same those are the same and then of course the right angle is the same so no matter how you draw the triangle um, the triangles are similar and so the ratios of their sides are the same okay um, all right, so that is slope. You often, you often see that slope is um, rise over run. And people are just, this is just different terminology. So instead of delta y, they're calling it the rise because that's how far the triangle goes up is the rise. And um, the distance that it goes over is called the, uh, the run. Um, another way, another way to kind of do this in a like a generic way. Let's let's do it a little bit more algebraically here. Okay, so I've got a line there. Let's say that this is a point um, x y on the line right there, and maybe that we're thinking of that point as kind of fixed or something. And now we're thinking of this as being like a, a point that might vary. So I'll give it a little subscript. These ones mean maybe this point is like moving around a little bit or something <clears throat> so now if i make this if i make this triangle um, with these values then i can actually write down some algebra so now m is equal to the um, the difference in the y's so i can write that as y minus y1 on top so the difference between the y's i use this y first on the top so i have to use this x first on the bottom x minus x1 and what that is, that's just a different way of saying delta y over delta x. Um, but uh, this this formula is uh, is kind of cool because um, I can I can rearrange things here. And if you don't if you don't follow this algebra, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to write this as m times x minus x one. So this is the same equation as before. I've just multiplied both sides by x minus one and then flipped the, um, the order in which I write them on the, on the equal sign. So this is called the, the point slope form of a line. And it's very important. Um, it's called point slope form of a line, of a line because you might know that a line is determined by well, there's lots of ways to determine a line. Um, everybody knows, I think, or I remember learning when I was very young that two points determine a line. So for any two points, there's a unique line that goes through the two points. Um, but it's also true that everything about a line is determined by one point on it and then its slope. So if you know a point on a line and then you know a slope of a line going through it, then you should be able to figure out the line. So let's just give a concrete example here. So let's say that the point um, is, I don't know, uh, one, three, and then the slope is uh, two. Okay, so now we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out the equation for that line in standard form. So we want to figure out M and B basically in this formula. So we'll come back down there. <clears throat> And we'll use this formula to do it. So the point slope form is how you go from this description of a line, which is a point and a slope, to the standard form. 
all you have to do is uh, fill in these numbers. So we'll think of this as being x, y, and now this, this point is gonna be one, three or something. Um, so um, now we'll, we'll just use, uh, for y1, instead of writing y1 in that formula, we'll use three. And instead of using x1 in this formula, we'll use one. Let's see what happens when we do that. We get um, y minus three is equal to m, but we know m because we're told that the slope is two. So y minus three is equal to two times um, x minus one. And this is, uh, this is pretty much it. Now, now you have to do a little bit of algebra, but often you don't even really care about that. Um, but I'm gonna do it here just for the sake of completeness. So I would move that three over. So this would be uh, two x minus one plus three. Now I would distribute this two. It gives me two x minus two plus three. And now I would collect these terms. So the final standard form of this line would be two x plus one. <clears throat> okay, so now we kind of know everything about that line, so that's great. So this is actually going to be uh, very important. Um, one, one other thing I, I, I need to point out about lines is that lines that have positive slope look like this. They go up, so positive slope. Um, <clears throat> so that means as you go over to the right, you go up. But there's also negative slope, which looks like this. So those are the ones that go down. Um, so this is what negative slope looks like. And when you have a line with negative slope, it means as you go over to the right, you have to go down, actually. So that's, uh, that's negative slope. Um, positive slope, this is a line with positive slope, so it would kind of look like this, be going up. And um, line with negative slope would look like that. What would a line with zero slope look like? Straight. What would it be? Straight horizontally. Exactly, yeah, totally horizontal. So a perfectly horizontal line um, would have zero slope. So this is an important fact for calculus. So a line has zero slope um, if it's horizontal. So this is if and only if. So if it has zero slope, then it's horizontal. And if it is horizontal, it has zero slope. Uh, why is that? It's because if you go over you can write down delta x, that's no problem, but then delta y is always zero. So delta y over delta x is always just um, zero over something. And that's actually not undefined unless delta x is also zero. This is just zero. So that's, um, that's a horizontal line. And then there's also the, uh, you know, um, the vertical line case is, is also a little bit weird. So you can have a totally vertical line and then you have the opposite problem. Um, it's no problem to write down delta y, but then delta x is always zero for a vertical line. And so what you get is delta y over zero, which is undefined. Um, so vertical lines have an undefined slope. <clears throat> kind of think of it as being infinity, but you don't know if it's positive infinity or negative infinity. It's just, it's kind of, it's just undefined. All right. All right, so we've talked about point slope forms. So the, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, polynomials. So a polynomial uh, is sort of the simplest kind of function that's not a line. Um, so those are things like, we've already looked at a few, like x squared or x squared minus 2x plus 1, um, etc. cetera. Um, the general form of a polynomial is f of x equals a n, which is just some number, um, times x to the n plus a n minus one times x to the n minus one plus, 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 all the way down until you get to these lower terms. So eventually you'll run into a one times x and then a zero is the constant term. So this one would be the constant term there. Um, so there's some terminology. This one that comes first is called the, the leading coefficient. All of these numbers, by the way, these little a's are called coefficients. They can just be any real numbers. So ai is just some number in the real numbers for i equals one. Oh, actually, i starts at zero. Zero, one, all the way up to n. <clears throat> so they're just real numbers. 
and um, the leading coefficient is, is the one that um, is on Xn. You could, if you want, if you were perverse, you could think of this polynomial going on to have a zero coefficient for the Xn plus one term, and then you know all zeros over here, n plus two, and you could imagine it just going on infinitely, but that's not helpful. The leading coefficient is the um, is the coefficient that goes the, the sort of the the one that goes on the the power of x, the last non-zero leading coefficient. Sorry, the last non-zero coefficient is the leading coefficient, and the the corresponding n here is called the degree. So this is the degree of the polynomial. So for instance, both of these polynomials would be degree two. But if I were to write down x to the uh, 17 plus uh, x cubed minus 37 or something, then the degree would be 17. And the leading co what would the leading coefficient be for this polynomial? Negative 37? Um, that would be the constant. That would be, this is the constant term. One. Yes, one, because one is one is implicitly here. That's right. Very good. So one is one would be the leading coefficient, and negative thirty-seven would be what we call the constant term. Um, okay. And these these n's here, n has to be an integer. So that means it has to be a whole number. Or actually, it has to be a positive integer. Uh, or non-negative, it's a non-negative integer. So um, that means um, n can take any value in the set um, 0, 1, 2, 3, whoa, oops, um, et cetera. So you might say, what is a zero degree polynomial? This is kind of silly. You do a zero up here. You could have, just like you could have written one in the, in the front, you could also write x zero here, but it, it's silly because um, <clears throat> anything except zero to the zeroth power is just one. So that's just another way of writing one. So we just don't bother to write it there. But a zero degree polynomial would be a to the zero times x to the zero, which would just be a to the zero. In other words, it's just a number. Um, so when you just do arithmetic, in some, in some sense, you're still working with polynomials. You're just working with zero degree polynomials. Numbers are just polynomials of zero degree. Um, so n has to be an integer. That means if you, if, if you have a negative number there, like if I look at x to the negative 17 or something, this is still kind of a nice function. It's very simple, but it's not a polynomial because um, it's negative. And if, if I were to write f of x equals the square root of x, that's a nice simple function, but it's not a polynomial because this is the same thing as x to the one half power and that's not an integer. Okay. <clears throat> so the, um, the simplest kinds of polynomials are called uh, quadratics. We're gonna run into quadratics a lot. So quadratic is just a fancy way of saying degree two polynomial. Um, so, for example, x squared is a, is a quadratic, and so is x squared minus 2x plus 1, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, in general, you, you can write this as um, ax squared plus bx plus uh, c. So, these, these numbers, these coefficients a, b, and c, they're just uh, real numbers, so they're n, the real numbers, and they can take on any value. Um, you might want to insist that a is not zero, just so you don't, you know, like you don't want to think of a, you could, people do say that a line is a degenerate quadratic because a line is just, this is a line, right? Instead of m and b, we're using b and c here, but this, this part is just a line. Um, and if a is equal to zero, then this quadratic would just be this part, and so it would be a line. Um, but you know, we'll we'll just think of a as as being non-zero, or else you should be talking about a line instead of a quadratic. So often we'll want to solve equations. So hopefully everybody knows how to solve linear equations, and actually hopefully everybody knows how to solve polynomial equations too. 
Um, so if I were to write down, let's just make something up, it's gonna be kind of nasty. So we'll say minus two x squared plus three uh, x um, minus four equals zero. But we wanted to solve this often for these kinds of made up problems that we do in a calculus class, um, you, can, you can factor the polynomial, um, but often you just have to use something called the quadratic formula. So hopefully everybody knows that. So I'll be talking about it a lot. If you wanna solve a general quadratic, then you have to use something called the quadratic formula. And <clears throat> hopefully this is a review. Um, so the way you solve a quadratic formula, the way you solve a general quadratic like this, is the solution is minus b plus or minus uh, b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay, so sometimes that will be a real number, in which case there are solutions. Um, sometimes you'll get a negative number under the radical, which means that there are no real solutions. Um, so that often happens actually because you know, the roots of, the, of a quadratic are just where it touches the x-axis. Um, so, in a, and generally there will be sort of two solutions here. Um, but there are other kinds of quadratics that never touch the x-axis. So if I wrote down the equation for that quadratic, then it would have no real solutions. So when I tried to do this formula, what would happen is I would get a negative number there. You can't take the square root of a negative number. So those are not real solutions. Um, <clears throat> another thing that can happen is that you can have um, one solution that has multiplicity two. So maybe this stuff is ringing a bell from 105 or something. But it might be that like the x-axis is actually tangent to the parabola or the quadratic. And in that case, you would have something like, you know, x minus two squared or something. So it has the same root twice. Um, but anyway, let's, let's go ahead and find the solutions to this guy. So this is minus three plus or minus the square root of uh, nine, and now it's negative times negative ma makes positive eight, so it's minus 32 um, divided by um, negative four. So does this, uh, does this quadratic have any real solutions? No. No, because this part, this part is negative and you can't take the square root of a negative number. So this would be, a, if we were to graph it, this would be a, per, a, a quadratic that looks kind of like that. By the way, all, all quadratics graph is parabolas. The parabola is like uh, this shape. Um, <clears throat> okay. So speaking of which, um, let's maybe we should click back over to Desmos and just look at the graphs of a few polynomials. So let me clear all these. Um, so you can experiment here and convince yourself that it really is true that if you put in any quadratic, it doesn't matter what, um, the result is a, uh, is a parabola. So here I just sort of randomly type that in. That's a parabola. Um, just general stuff about graphing. Um, you know, if you change the constant term, if I make that, if, if I, I can, right? I can, make the, uh, I can make the parabola move up and down on the y-axis by making the constant term smaller. But all the, um, the constant term just has to do with um, where the, sorry, um, what the intercept is. So the constant term determines the intercept for a line, but it, it determines the intercept for everything. So now if I were to change two to, see, see how it goes through the y-axis exactly at two? It's because if I were to put zero in, um, then two would come out. So that's what gives you the intercept there. If I change this two to a 10, it's exactly the same shape. It's just moved up a little bit so that it goes through the x, it goes through the y-axis now at 10 instead of two. If I change this to 15, it goes through up here at 15, et cetera. Um, so every, you know, every function has an intercept, not just, uh, not just, um, lines. So I want, what I want to kind of get at here, I guess we should also talk for a second about cubic polynomials. So a cubic polynomial looks, looks like this. So that's just x cubed. Um, you can kind of vary that shape a little bit, like, like uh, just make this minus five or something. So this is kind of a general cubic. 
Um, so notice that there are sort of two humps. So the degree is three, that lets you afford kind of two changes of direction here. And in this class, you'll learn why that's true um, using the, uh, the derivative. So any cubic can kind of change direction at most two times. Um, let's look at a, a quartic, so that would be a degree four. We get degree four uh, minus three x cubed plus x squared plus 22 or something. Change that to two. <coughs> okay, so I got, I got this. Um, let me just see if I can get this to look slightly different. Uh, it's not really what I wanted. About five here, no. Okay, this is kind of what I wanted. Um, so here I've got a, um, <coughs> a quartic, so that's degree four. So when it's degree four, you can, you can afford um, three changes of direction. So one, two, and then it changes direction again down here, right? So, a, um, so the degree of a, of a polynomial tells you how many times it can change direction. Um, the degree also tells you the, um, the maximum number of real roots um, in, in the complex numbers, a degree n polynomial has n roots. So it, this has four complex roots, but it only has two real roots, these that happen right there. <clears throat> Notice if I, make the, um, if I make the leading coefficient negative, then it flips upside down. Okay, if I, right, so it's kind of a, a switch that you can flip. Um, all right, so now I, I want to kind of tell you what every polynomial looks like kind of, for the purposes of this class. Let's make a new sheet here. Um, okay, so if the polynomial has even degree, then it looks basically like this. So first let's assume that the leading coefficient is uh, positive. So if the leading coefficient is positive, then it comes down from the top. And then when it gets close to the origin, it flips around a few times depending on its degree. Its degree might only let it do it a couple times. And then it goes back off to the top. Um, if the leading coefficient is negative, then it's sort of the inverted picture of that where it comes up from down there. And then it can change direction a few times, but eventually it has to go back down where it came from. Um, all odd degree polynomials look like this. So if you're odd degree, um, then um, first let's consider the case where the leading coefficient is positive. If the leading coefficient is positive, then it comes up from down here, and then it changes direction a few times, and then it, comes, it goes off to infinity there. And I'll just do the, the case where the leading coefficient is negative in a different color. So if the le leading coefficient is negative, then you get sort of the opposite. It comes down from up there and then goes down like that. Um, all right, so that's sort of what every polynomial looks like. Can, I'm gonna, we're going to use that fact several times in the class. <clears throat> so let's practice, let's practice factoring a little bit. So that's another thing that's going to come up. Um, so if I write down the polynomial, this is mostly for quadratics. So if I do x squared minus 2x, um, uh, this is... Uh, and if I do minus two here, sorry, I, I just, something in my notes didn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, sorry, I wrote the wrong thing for my notes. So in my notes it says x squared minus x um, minus two. So when you factor a polynomial, you write it as a product of lines. Um, okay, so do, can anybody do this? Anybody know how to factor this? Uh, the first thing you do put x on both sides. Yeah, you can put an x here like this. For more complicated cases, you might have something on the x, but this is a simple case. You put um, minus uh, minus one and minus uh, minus two. Yeah, so minus so one and plus two. Oh, but you switch it around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So what we're looking for here. Um, Let's just, let's just do this out in the abstract. So what if I have um, x plus a times x plus b, then this is gonna be 
um, x squared plus um, bx plus ab, or sorry, ax, um, plus ab. Let me just rewrite this a different way. So this is x squared plus a plus b times x um, plus ab. So when you factor a quadratic like this one, <clears throat> you look for, for two numbers. So I want two numbers that add to be minus one in this case. And um, there's, they should multiply to be negative two. So can anybody think of two numbers that add to uh, 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 this, this student who's, who, who was that that gave the answer? Uh, Pretty. Um, yeah. yeah, so like, like you said, um, you, need, you need, the answer here is gonna be negative two and positive one. So if I do minus two and positive one, it's sort of like, solves this. If you get good at it, you can do it mentally pretty fast. So um, you just need two numbers that multiply to be negative two, that add to be minus one, and then you can kind of do this mentally pretty fast. And this is why it works. It's because in the general case, you've got uh, for the middle coefficient, this is the sum, and for the, um, the constant coefficient, it's just the, the product of the, um, the roots. Okay. Um, so what about like, uh, here's, here's something that comes up often called um, difference of squares. So uh, it many times, many times in this, in this semester, I'm gonna say the words difference of squares, and this is what I mean. So if you, if you take any two numbers that are squares and you take their difference, like A and B here, this is always equal to um, A plus B times A minus B. This is a very useful formula. Um, so we're going to use it all the time. Like here's an example of when it, when it might be used. Let's say we're doing calculus and we run into the expression a squared minus one. Um, uh, sorry, x squared minus one. So both x squared and one are squares. So I might find it convenient to use difference of squares to write this as x plus one times x minus one. Right, so you could do that if you wanted to. Also, if you had like, I don't know, um, x to the fourth, plus two, um, you could write this as x squared plus the square root of two times x squared minus the square root of two. So there's lots, lots of things that you can do. Um, so for algebraic manipulation, difference of squares is very useful. Um, another thing that we're gonna do often is uh, factor expressions. So we, we're gonna do things like factor out x often. So maybe we'll, we'll run into an expression that looks like x squared plus um, 3x minus 2x cubed. So each one of these terms here has an x in it. So you can pull it out to the side. This is what we call factoring an expression or factoring out an x. So that leaves x plus 3 uh, minus 2x squared. So x has come out to the left here and now everything inside has lost a factor of x. So this lost a factor of x and this two became a one. This lost a factor of x and the x is just gone and only three remains. And this thing lost an x and the degree went from three down to, to two here. Notice that you can multiply this x back in and it would go back to the way it was before. So nothing has changed. So they really are equal. So um, the top expression is equal to the bottom expression. Um, here's, here's something else that we will do that is uh, not easy. So let's say we take one over X and we want, this is just fractions, kind of abstract fractions. Let's say we want to add one over X to one over the square root of X plus one. Um, so how do, I, how do I do that? Does anybody know how I would do that? You'd have to make them have a common denominator. Yeah, and what would the common denominator be? And just the product, let's just use the product of the denominators. There might be something smarter to do, but you can always just use the product of the denominators. Um, so we'll use um, x times the square root of x plus one. Um, so now we multiply top and bottom over here by that, so that puts square root of x plus one there. And um, over here, 
we still have we have the same common denominator because it's common. Um, but to make this thing uh, look right, I have to multiply top and bottom by x, and so that puts an x up here. And now, because they have a common denominator, I can add them straight across, and I get uh, square root of x plus 1 plus x over x times the square root of x plus 1. OK, and you're done. That's not easy. I'm just saying we're going to be doing that. <laughs> so you can practice. I can help you. Um, so this has, this has nothing to do with what we were just doing, but another algebraic trick that I will do that, that might be confusing if you haven't seen it in a while, whenever you have something in the numerator of a fraction like this, it can always sort of fall off to the left. So just without comment, I might rewrite the same expression as the square root of x plus 1 plus x times 1 over um, x times the square root of x plus 1. These would be the same. Um, the, reason, the reason they are the same is you can think of this as being sort of over 1, and this being a product of fractions. When you multiply fractions, you just always go straight across, right? p over q times r over s is always just pr over qs. When you multiply 1 in the bottom, it does nothing. So these really are equal. Um, but what I'll just do is I think of it as the thing on the top just falling off to be on the left. OK. So um, this, this brings us to exponent rules. This will be very important. So exponent rules. Um, so you guys know, I hope, that this is just a review. Square root of x is equal to x to what power? One half? Yeah, one half, right? And the cube root of x is x to the? One third. Yeah, one third. And the nth root of x is equal to x to the? One over n? Yeah, one over n. So that's, that's with a fractional, uh, when, whenever you see an x with a fractional exponent, it means that there's some kind of root there. Okay, that's just what it means. And also, 1 over x is um, x to the what power? Negative 1? Yeah, negative 1. And um, 1 over x squared is x to the? Negative 2. Yeah, negative 2. And so 1 over x to the n is just? x to the minus n. So whenever you have a negative exponent, it just means that you have to reciprocate before you apply the exponent. Um, there's a, another thing that happens here, which is, um, this is just a rule, like x to the a to the b is equal to, anybody know what this is? x to a times b. Yeah, that's right. OK, great. Um, so now if you have x to some complicated thing, let's say we have x to the minus 7 thirds here or something. Let's try to unpack this. So this is the same thing as um, x to the um, minus 1 third. Let's just say it like that, OK, um, to the seventh power. It's just taking the, x, the 7 outside. So what is this x to the minus 1 third? You could write it as? 1 over the cube root of x. And then this is all to the seventh power, so like this. Whoa, didn't mean to do that. Um, and so this would be equal to 1 over the cube root of x to the seventh power. OK, so we have to be pretty good at, at you know, manipulating those, those powers and stuff and stuff like that. So just letting you know. Another rule that comes up often is um, x to the a times x to the b is equal to, what happens here? a and b add together. Yeah, great. That's right. Um, so x to the a plus b. So for example, if I did x to the minus 3 times x to the uh, 20, this would be 
x to the minus 3 plus 20, which is x to the 17th power. Um, OK, and if uh, x to the a over x to the b, what happens here? A and B subtract. Yeah, great. So this is A minus B. Perfect. Um, so just to give an example, if I have X to the pi over um, X to the 8, then this is X to the pi minus 8. OK. Um, all right. So we have uh, just a couple minutes left. Let me do one more thing, which is um, composition of functions. Hopefully all of this stuff is, is just a review. Um, so let's say I have um, f of x is equal to sine x and um, g of x is equal to x squared. What would f compose with g be? This is the same thing as f of g of x. sin x squared? Yeah, so we would, we would have uh, sine, but where, where the input was x before, now the input is g of x, uh, which is sine of x squared. Okay. Um, now let's do it the other way. What is, um, what is g composed with f? Uh, wouldn't it be um sine sine squared sine of x squared? Yeah, sine of x squared. Good. So it's sine of x squared. Um, so usually you would write this. So notice two things here. What if you just what if you just encountered somebody wrote down sine x squared? It would be a little bit ambiguous. It, it could be either one of these, right? So it would be reasonable to conclude that. The person is talking about this, but it would also be kind of reasonable to conclude that they're talking about that. So um, that expression is kind of ambiguous. And for that reason, there's like a convention, which is whenever you have this case, you always write the square just on the trig function. So we would write this as sine squared x instead of, right? So if you saw sine x squared, then you know you're talking about this. But if you were to see, um, if you were to see sine x squared out in the wild, you would assume that the person is talking about this situation. Um, and that's, uh, that's all we have time for. Could everybody do, do me a favor and just, um, and just chat something down at the bottom of the screen? Um, you can see there's a, a chat button. And so that's, that's an easy way for me to take attendance if everybody just you know, chats hello or something. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording.